fabulous guy and Charles have mentioned, our title for this morning's lesson is indeed People of Prayer. And I would like to encourage you to keep your Bibles there to Acts chapter 4. And thank you, Brother Horde, for a great job reading our scripture together this morning. If you have a copy of our weekly newsletter, you can turn to the back side of this newsletter for our Bible study outline. Or if you prefer to use your iPad or your iPhone or your Android mobile device, you can scan the QR code and access our digital sermon notes. How did the early church do it? That is the question that I often ask as I read the early section of the book of Acts. How is it that the early church literally turned the Roman Empire upside down within one generation? How did they do such a thing? Well, there are many answers presented in the book of Acts to such a question, but one of the clearest answers to this question you'll find from the book of Acts is that the early church relied upon fervent prayer. In fact, if you study the book of Acts, you'll notice that 48 times, write this down in your notes, 48 times in the book of Acts, it tells us they prayed. They prayed, they prayed, they prayed. In fact, the very first prayer meeting of such, you might say, of the disciples of Christ is found in Acts chapter 1. Jesus had given them this impossible assignment to take the gospel to the ends of the earth, and then he goes back to heaven, and they're overwhelmed, and, and they go back to Jerusalem. They're overwhelmed, and they gather for what? They gather for prayer, and what did they do for 10 days straight? The Bible tells us they prayed, and how did God answer that prayer? Well, a little thing called Pentecost. Literally, the Holy Spirit came down upon them and they went out and they all taught and preached the gospel. In fact, Peter preached what some have estimated was a mere 10-minute sermon and 3,000 plus people tasted of salvation on that day. Let's do the math together, okay? They prayed for how many days? Ten days. They preached for ten minutes. 3,000 people came to faith. Today, what do we do? We pray for ten minutes, and we preach for ten days. And we're lucky if three people get saved. I mean, there's something wrong with that, I believe. I, I think it tells us a little bit about our priorities that they're sort of out of whack. The early church, we know for certain of their reliance upon prayer. In fact, if you look at history, especially in the New Testament, any time there was a great move of God, it was always an answer to God's people crying out in prayer to Him. Let me put it to you this way this morning, church. The greatest concern of Satan, the thing that he is most focused on this morning is trying to keep the saints from prayer. He fears nothing about our prayerless Bible studies, our prayerless ministries, our prayerless religion. He laughs at our labor. He mocks at our earthly wisdom, but he trembles when we pray. Prayer can turn ordinary men and women into men and women of power. Because there is no greater power that is available to us than that of prevailing prayer, church. In fact, as the title this morning says, we are to truly be people of prayer. Amen? So what we're going to do this morning is we're going to study 
specifically here from Acts chapter 4, the prayer of the early church. It's actually the, the second prayer meeting that's talked about in the book of Acts. And, and let me set it up for you. And, and, and Earl did a great job reading this for us. But you've got Peter and John. They preach Christ in the temple. A lot of stuff goes on, and, and many people come to faith. And in turn, with all this commotion, Peter and John are arrested for preaching Christ. They spend the night in jail. The next day, they're brought before the Sanhedrin. That's sort of like the Jewish version of the Supreme Court. And, and they're warned. They're even foretold, if you keep doing this, listen, if you keep doing this, we're going to treat you just like we treated Jesus. So they, they get all this information. And then they head back to their own people or, or to the church. Chapter 4, verse 23, look at it. It says, after they were released, they went to their own people and reported everything the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard this, they what? They raised their voices together to God. Church, their first response was prayer. Their knee-jerk reaction was to go to God in prayer. Facing this incredibly difficult situation, they knew that prayer was their first and foremost answer. It was the only way that they would be capable of handling this circumstance. So here in Acts chapter 4, I'm going to share with you this morning three motivations, three things that truly motivate us to pray. And I hope that you will write these down, jot these down, note them together with me this morning. The, the first one is this. We will pray when life's circumstances seem overwhelming. I don't know about you, church, but when my back is up against the wall, or I'm lying flat on my back, I'll pray like never before. The fact is, whenever we are desperate, we will pray. And here's the key. The early church knew they were desperate. Again, look at the circumstances. Acts chapter 4 and verse 18. This is what happened. They called for them and they ordered them, Peter and John, not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. And then you look down at verse 21. And when they had further threatened them, then they let them go. So here, the early church, they're like, oh my goodness. They are threatening to kill us. Just imagine, church, this morning, if what happened to Peter and John happened to the church that exists here in our country. What if the very same threats were made against the church of America? How would we respond? Let me ask you, church, would we call for a prayer meeting? No, I'll tell you what most of us would do. We would call for a strategy meeting. Most churches today, they would call for some sort of strategy. Hey, hey goodness, you know, we, we've got to come up with a plan, right? We've got to come up with a plan to keep Peter and John out of jail. And we'd be in this meeting, and one person would stand up and say, hey, I got an idea. You know, Peter and John, this preaching about Jesus, about his crucifixion, about repentance, man, that's a little offensive to people. So Peter and John, you just need to take it down a notch. That is what the American church of the day would have told Peter and John. You get it, right? It's happening in our society. Just take it down a notch. You can't be so offensive. But then there would also be somebody I know in this meeting that would go, man, we got to call somebody. 
Does, does anybody here know anybody in our local legislator? Does anybody have people in high places that you can talk to? Because we got to talk to somebody that can make a difference. Well, listen, church, we already know somebody in high places, don't we? I don't need a governor. I don't need a president. I've got a God. And he is the highest source of power I could turn to. We need to come to God like the early church did with this type of confidence. See, I I believe our problem, the reason why many of us in this room do not pray as we ought to, could it be that, that there are folks who don't really believe they need God? That think I can handle this on my own? We're so full of pride, so full of self-sufficiency that we just don't pray. But guess what? When we get desperate, we pray, don't we? All those physical illusions, those emotional illusions where we say, oh my goodness, I can't pray. Jonathan, I don't know how to pray. I I don't know how to pray, Jonathan. I don't know how to do that. Guess what? Whenever your child gets really, really sick, you pray, don't you? When you lose your job and your bank account is in the negative, and you got a mortgage payment coming up next week, guess what? What church? You'll pray, won't you? When your spouse comes home at the end of the day and says, I don't love you anymore, I'm done, I want a divorce, I'm out of here, guess what? You'll hit your knees and you'll start praying like you've never prayed before because you are desperate. The early church, they were desperate. And one of the very reasons why we're not turning passing to Texas upside down the way that the early church was able to turn Rome upside down is because many of us in this room, we don't see the situation as desperate. We just think, no big deal, right? Let me tell you, church, we are living in desperate times. Do you know how many lost people there are just right around our church building? People that are dying without Jesus Christ? People that are suffering the pain of sin and death with no hope this morning? Don't tell me that that isn't a desperate situation that we ought to be not praying for. No, it ought to be the very thing that we're desperate to be praying for. In fact, here's a a basic principle I want you to write down in your outline. I'm not sure that this is on the screen, but it's this. Prayerlessness exposes a lack of of dependence upon God. We think we can handle it on our own. We don't really need to feel this desperate times, desperate measures. We don't need to seek after God. But the truth is, we are desperate. Let me put it to you this way. If this makes no sense to you, maybe this will. The problem is, the situation may be desperate, but most of us are not desperate. The second motivation that will cause you to pray, and I truly believe this, jot this down. Number two, when we're certain of God's control. Again, when we're certain of God's control. The fact is, you are clearly more likely to pray when you believe and trust that God is the one in control. You see, if you if you don't believe that God is good and that He hears your prayers and can do anything, you won't pray. But if you believe, 
you know what? Our God is, is big and He's great and He loves me and He's in control. Then you'll pray to Him. You know, when we were kids, we would sing, My God is so big, so strong and so mighty, there's nothing our God cannot do. How many of you remember singing that? And I mean, as a kid, you thought that is so true. Our God is so big and so strong and so mighty. There's nothing our God cannot do. And then we grow up and we say, what, what, but I guess maybe not this. When we look back at the early church, there are two things that stand out. Number one, folks, they believed that God is the God, first of all, over creation. They believe that God is the one who created it all, and He's the one who sustains it all. Notice how they put this in verse 26. I love this verse. First of all, it says, they pray, Master. They called God Master. You know why they called Him Master? Because He is, right? They called Him Master because He is Master. And then what? You are the one. You are the one who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You know what, church? You know what they're doing right there? They are acknowledging that God is the creator, that he is in control of the creation. And and folks, one thing that does not seem even apparently uh, to be an issue for the early church, they truly believed that God is the God over creation. But they didn't just believe that. They also believed that God was the God over history. Let me tell you, church, this is where we struggle. Sometimes you'll hear me say this and kind of laugh it off, but I'll say that history is actually His story not just the fun, it's the truth. History is God's story. But the problem is some of us in this room believe that God just kind of wound up this clock and just let it go and whatever happens, happen, que sera, sera, you know the whole deal, right? The idea that God just wound it up and let it go and things, He just set it aside and He's letting it run. But no, the early church did not believe in God that way. He didn't, they didn't look at God that way. They believed that God intervened. They believed that God intervenes in our lives. That God is in control not only today, but He's in control of tomorrow, just as certainly He was in control of the day before. And what's interesting is they talk about, here in this passage, an event in history where it might seem to some that God was completely out of control. We're talking about the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. It looks like, oh my goodness, madness has taken over. And yet even during the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, God was in control. Look how they say this, verse 27. You've got to love this. Remember, this is just a few months after Jesus' crucifixion. It says, in this city, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel assembled together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed to do whatever your hand, and look at it, church, your plan had predestined to take place. You go, what is that all about? What's that saying? That's saying that even with all the evil schemes and all the evil people, and evil plans, God was orchestrating folks. He's so great, He's so powerful, that He even took their evil and created something good out of it. You know, I was thinking about this this past week. Try to sit from God's throne and look down on this earth and see the earth united 
in crucifying your only son. Can you try to do that for just a moment? Hard to do. Try to sit in that throne for just a moment, look down on this earth and see the whole earth united in crucifying your own son. Hear them crying out, crucify him, crucify him. You know, the problem is, it dawned on me, a lot of times when we think of that image, We think that God is up there in heaven just pacing back and forth, wringing his hands. That God is like, oh no, they're going to crucify my son. I never saw this coming. Is that the way it happened, church? No. He knew all along. This was always foreseen by God. And that's why it's important. There are a lot of evil things in this world. You've got to know that. But there's always, even when evil has a plan, God has a greater plan. And you can trust Him to intervene and work His plan. And the most amazing thing about God this morning that I want you to remember, especially about His sovereignty and His plans, is that your prayers... Your prayers are part of God's plan. You ever stop to think about that? Because when you do, it'll blow your mind. To think about God being so sovereign and so in control, and yet in the midst of it all, church, your prayers are already taken into God's plan. You know something, church, whenever God prompts you to pray about something, it means that God's up to something pretty big in your life. Number three, we'll pray when we trust that God will empower us. I mean, the reality of this lesson this morning is when you believe that God will empower you in the midst of a difficult circumstance, you will pray about it. You will pray about it. Look at verse 29. And now, Lord, consider their threats and grant that your servants, listen to this, church, may speak your word with all what? Church, say it. Boldness. You go, wait, Jonathan, isn't boldness what got these folks in trouble to begin with? Why in the world? Are they praying for boldness? Let me ask you, church, is that typically how we pray? Let's think about it. Let's think about it for just a moment. We're facing a little pushback as Christians. The church is facing a little persecution. Here's what we pray. God, please deliver us from this persecution. That's what we pray. Did they pray, God, please deliver us from this difficult situation? Is that what they prayed? No. They said, God, this is a tough one. God, we want you to empower us to speak even more boldly. The problem is, though, our prayers are pretty superficial in nature, if we just really think about it. Like, for instance, we'll be going on a trip. And we'll pray for traveling mercy. Some of you are too young to know what that is, but that's where you pray, God, please keep us safe uh, as we go on this trip together. And the whole time, God's uh, up there going, okay, if you'll drive the speed limit and wear your seatbelt, I got you. Or you pray before a meal. God, please bless this food to the what? Nourishment of my body. And God's up there, well, if you eat one less hamburger and a few less fries, I got you, right? And that's funny, but it's true. I mean, I remember as a kid, this happened so often. I'd have a test setting out in front of me, and my prayer would be gone. Oh, I'll do anything if you'll let me pass this test. And the whole time, you know, God's up there going, well, if you just have studied for it, I could really help you right now. 
the, the, the point is, our, our prayers are pretty superficial. What about these people's prayers? You know why they were able to turn Rome upside down? Because they prayed for boldness. And that's what we've got to pray for. When it comes to Kelly's Closet or any other evangelistic effort of this church, we better be praying to be bold because we are going to need it. I love the way this ends and the lesson is yours. But if you look back at verse 31. When they had prayed, the place where they assembled was shaken. There was an earthquake and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God. What's that last word, church? Boldly. They prayed about it. The place where they were shaken, and they began to speak even more boldly than they had done prior to this. I'm going to end with this, and the lesson is yours. There are two earthquakes. By the way, if you've ever, anybody here been through an earthquake? Yeah. You know, I thought I had gone through a tornado. That was a pretty bad deal. I had to move here to Houston to go through some floods and, and hurricanes. Those are pretty rough. But nothing scares me as much as an earthquake. I'll just be honest with you. I think it's because of my experience with it. But there are two earthquakes that you can experience in your life today. After we sing this song of encouragement and we go about and we go on to our Bible classes and we leave here today, there are two earthquakes that you're possibly going to experience. One is the earthquake of God's power. When that happens... It's going to bring about good things in your life. The other would be the earthquake of God's judgment. Listen, you don't want to leave here today with the earthquake of God's judgment awaiting you. Because nothing will break down the foundation of your reality of thinking you are secure than God shaking your foundation to its core. So this morning as we sing this song of encouragement, maybe there is somebody here today who has not relied on prayer as the single source of strength to get you through whatever it is you're dealing with. Maybe you've tried all these other things. Maybe you've got read self-help. You've talked to your friends. You've, you've contacted your favorite counselor. You've gone everywhere you could possibly think of, but the one great source of power that is availed to you, and that's the power of prayer. If there's somebody here that like that this morning, I'm not expecting you to run down this aisle and say, church, I've been a terrible prayer person. Because guess what? If that were the case, there wouldn't be enough seats up here to contain everybody. Is that true? So I'm not expecting that. I'm not expecting a bunch of people to run down here and go, hey, church, I've been a terrible prayer person. But if you do need to change that, learn from the example of Acts chapter 4. Pray with boldness so that you can speak with boldness, so that God can shake up your cul-de-sac, your workplace, your school, wherever it is that there are people that are lost without Jesus, that He can shake it up and turn it upside down for His good. If there's any way we can assist you this morning, let us help you now.